Hello, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. My name is David Guadrelli. I am joined by Harmon Dial, our technical producer. The man at the controls is Grady Sass from the iconic Sheraton Wall Center. This episode of Canucks Conversation is brought to you by our friends over at Greta Bar YVR, the home of our electric watch parties. Greta is Canucks Army's spot to catch the game throughout the season, playoffs, and also our place to chill in the offseason. We're going to have another watch party coming soon, folks. The first one was electric. I hear I was in Edmonton for the first watch party. I don't know if I told Me you too. that. Yeah, we were. We were there together. You know what we didn't do? We didn't do our West Edmonton mall trip. Yeah, it's overrated in my opinion. Yeah, but the West Edmonton Mall Harvey's isn't. Like Harvey's, we don't get Harvey's out here. Harvey's Harvey's is one of the best fast food chains, I think, ever. But in terms of burger joints, I think it's right up there. The, the it's It's the best of Subway where you get to make your sandwich, right? But it's combined with like a good burger. I, I like it. Harvey's was awesome. It's good it's you remember not when they as used to, good as your advertising yes, that's it's fair. no wendy's i'll tell you that that's course. absolutely true but do you remember when harvey's was in all the home depots yeah yeah i always wanted it but i know good times yeah. i never got it at the home depots me so, neither. something about getting food out of a home depot that is a little off-putting to me the smell of home depot is really nice by the way just a random aside isn't it just wood like don't you yeah, just smell wood it yeah it smells nice yeah wood does smell nice for sure uh okay so like we said, our show today is brought to you by Greta YVR. <clears throat> right off the top, we have to address some controversy here in the Canucks Army studios here, which obviously we share with our friends over at Sakaris and Price. They record before we do. There was some drama this morning. As people noted yesterday, Chairgate had its first chapter yesterday because Harmon raised his chair, which is also our dear friend Matt Sakaris's chair. And Matt did not like that his chair was raised. But get this, apparently... He blamed it on the short guy. He, he's like, oh, it had to be quads. Had to be quads raising the chair. No, Blake, who uses my chair, can attest that I don't I don't mess with the chair. I'm happy with my chair. Harmon over here, on the other hand, checking the lumbar support, all the other stuff that you got to do to your chair. <laughs> well, yours don't is- mess with my chair, Harmon. What did I tell you about touching things <laughs> that aren't yours? I don't mess with the chairs. I just want to point that out. Well, yeah, Chairgate has the second chapter. Well, yeah, it's because your chair's already lifted to an appropriate height. Yeah. W- without without my adjustment, I look <laughs> shorter than you. Matt is when a I'm... tall guy. Matt is taller yeah. than you. Like we we talk about how I'm short, you're tall. Matt is taller than both of us. Yeah. So it's just it's it's a disparity. It's unfortunate, but I had to do what I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, <laughs> Okay, yeah. Vancouver versus Anaheim tonight. Andre Kuzmenko makes his return to the lineup. The full scenes from Morning Skate, courtesy of our pal Jeff Patterson, is up now at CanucksArmy.com. Because it's a podcast, because it's a live show, we're not going to dive too much into tonight's matchup. We're going to look, as the title suggests, more big picture. Eight simple rules for defending or managing the Canucks defense. Excuse me. Do you remember that show? Eight simple rules for dating my teenage daughter? No. Did you watch it? It used to be on YTV late at night so it was it was before our time but they would do reruns of it and i remember watching it It was a good show it was a good show okay uh going off that vancouver versus anaheim andre kuzmenko gets back in the lineup we expect phil di giuseppe to be out of the lineup you and i before coming in here were listening to what rick talkett had to say this morning and at yesterday's morning skate and one thing he pointed out about pdg was something i think we've noticed as well is just that He's starting to get away from the things that make him a successful player, and that's forechecking very hard. That was what Talkett really pointed out. And when you're a career AHLer and you're, I don't want to say miscast, but you're being used in a top six role in the NHL, which I don't think anybody really saw coming, you're going to have to have your A game every single night. And I almost think it's a similar situation to that of Dakota Joshua, where, look, as soon as he stops doing those little things and stops going... You get a night off. You get a night to just, you know, kind of reset. And hopefully PDG is able to come back and start to do those things well again. But I think we've noticed it lately. That has been slipping a little bit in his game. All his play away from the puck and, you know, his puck retrievals have slipped in recent games. Definitely. It's, you know how on yesterday's show, I think it was, or or maybe it was uh, last Friday, I mentioned that, if Andre Kuzmenko isn't driving offense, what is what else is he adding to the table? It's the same thing for Di Giuseppe, except with his forechecking. If PDG is not forcing the other team to turn pucks over on the forecheck, what is he bringing to the table? 
Uh, and for Di Giuseppe, I almost wonder if the heavy schedule is especially taxing for a player that plays such uh, a grinding style, mm. right? Other players can can sort of still be effective with their skill, but Di Giuseppe's effectiveness is pure hustle. It's pure heart. It's pure being an energizer bunny. And that can be tough to sustain over a full 82-game season, especially when there's a lot of travel involved. And so you hope that, hey, this is a chance to hit the reset button, give him potentially some some extra rest, and that hopefully he can look like he's shot out of a cannon uh, when he does return. Of course, I, I should also mention, at yesterday's practice, he was the odd man out during the line rushes, but Talkett did not sort of exactly and we talked about it yesterday that this is something we've even seen with joshua that he was the odd man out at practice got into lineup the next game we'll we'll see but with kuzmenko returning who do you take out like yeah i would think maybe bovillier but i think the experiment with him with that miller line is too fresh for this to just be a okay you're out at practice you're back in the next game in terms of phil giuseppe i i think bovillier stays in the lineup but in the spirit of competition which we've talked about before and it'll be a topic on today's show as well you want to keep guys accountable and you want to keep that level of competition high. So I think the way you do that is, yeah, you give Phil Giuseppe the night off, but tomorrow or whenever the next game is, you take Anthony Beauvillier out. And I mean tomorrow because they're going to practice tomorrow probably. So you want Anthony Beauvillier probably as the next guy out. You're not taking out Nils Huglander, you yeah. hope, unless he has an egregious mistake tonight. Like that's the thing, right? That that can happen. You're probably not taking out Niels Huglander. You're probably not taking out... You're not taking out either Dakota Joshua or Connor Garland. Again, egregious mistake aside tonight. Um, you'd think Anthony Bovilli is the next guy to have a turn in the press box. Yeah, but the other thing to sort of keep in mind too is Bovilli over his NHL career has been a significantly better player than uh, PDG. So it's not a case that by default it's just going to be Bovilli. It's just, okay, now you get a perform to the level that we know you can uh, because if you don't then I think there's the pressure of okay then you're you're the next man up in terms of a a seat in the press box Um, so yeah that's that's fair as we continue our preview of today's game I want to get to this comment that I saw from a commenter on YouTube Shane O'Dell said no one has time for an hour-long podcast give me 10 minutes and get me the hell out I love you guys but get me the hell out Shane I I promise I didn't tell Shane to put this comment down to try to convince our bosses to let us work for 10 minutes and leave I didn't I didn't tell him to but Shane uh a lot of people do want us to talk for a little bit longer than 10 minutes and I just I was thinking about it I you know every other show in the market is longer than ours like every radio show is longer every um every podcast they're all longer like we probably have one of the shorter ones if not the shortest at least in like the mainstream sphere or whatever. And I, I don't know. I think a lot of them are too long. I agree, but I don't think 10 minutes. Come on, Jane. I think we're, I think we keep it pretty, pretty short here. We, we keep it pretty compact until quad starts going off about BCHL. Do you want to hear about the BCHL? No, <laughs> no. Next no. topic. Well, We'll keep moving on with the Canucks game preview, but I just want to get that. I thought that was a very funny comment from Shane that he was like, 10 minutes, get me out of here. Uh, also, the fact he said, I love you guys, but get me the hell out of here. It's like, Jeez, we don't have you trapped yeah, in the room like, with Shane, us. You, you could stop listening if nobody if you made, wanted to. Exactly. Nobody forced you to watch or listen, hey, Shane. We appreciate you listening, though, Shane. We do. Uh, we do. Okay. Cole McWard makes his season debut tonight. Mark Friedman is the odd man out. Does that surprise you at all? Because as soon as you walked in the office, you asked me about it and you said, wait, so not. Noah Juleson. Yeah, and then I realized, you know what? Juleson hasn't actually been that bad the last three games. For as much as I've uh, criticized the guy and as much as the results for the season have uh, not been promising and for as much as I'm still convinced that he should not be a full-time NHL defenseman, he's been good enough to stick in the lineup. Friedman's game has, um, has slipped. He hasn't quite been as calm, as steady, as reliable as he, as he was when he was playing on the right side next to Ian Cole, uh, which again, sort of tends to happen, right? Friedman was a typical quad a type defenseman where floating in between the AHL and NHL, I think he only had 50 odd games of NHL experience before this season. So for to expect him to maintain the level that he showed during his first handful of games in a Canuck uniform, 
uh, you, you probably didn't anticipate that lasting over the over the full season. So it doesn't surprise me. And um, I'm curious to see how McWard uh, looks. He had a strong preseason. And as long as he doesn't end up in penalty trouble like he did often in preseason, I, I don't think that there's much of a drop off there. Karan is getting his anyone else in very early, which we love to see. We can compile them and have them ready when we get to our anyone else segment later in the show. But he said, why are they so reluctant to put Hirose in the lineup? I think if he gets in the lineup, you're still going to see those sheltered minutes. But I think there are a lot of reasons that they're a bit reluctant with Hirose. I think his hockey IQ is very good. And that's something Tockett's even spoken about. But just in terms of getting physically overmatched at the NHL level, like, I don't think Hirose has that level to his game. Like we see guys like Quinn Hughes. I know maybe that's a bad comparison, but you know, Quinn Hughes can spin off of contact. He's really smart with his reads. And I think Hirose, while he does have a sharp hockey IQ, I still think there's just some room to grow physically for him uh, in terms of what he does with his body when he's out there. He also doesn't kill penalties, which uh, when you look at Juleson, for example, they lean on him in a second, second unit role. Especially when you have Hughes and and Hironic to a lesser extent, but Hironic isn't the biggest guy either. I'm sure that Talkin and Foot look at it and go, well, we're not the biggest blue line, especially with Carson Susi out. Do we really want to replace Susi, who's six foot six, six, six foot seven, um, with Hirose, who is light, who can get out muscled down low? And so right or wrong, I think it's, um, you know, part of it is stylistic for sure. Grim Studio said Hirose is too small and he gets outworked. Karan said, but wouldn't McWard also be outmatched physically? And Pimp Hand Strong, no. which is a great name, pointed out that McWard is bigger. I don't think McWard has been getting, just in the limited Abbotsford viewings I've seen and what I've talked to with Dave Hall, our guy out there in Abbotsford and Cody Sievertson, uh, McWard is stronger on pucks, for, at least from what I've seen. I think McWard is stronger on pucks. I think he is a little bit better physically, and I don't think he gets outmatched quite as easily as Hirose does. I don't think it's a little bit of a difference either. I mean, I remember when McWard first signed and I saw him at practice, and it's always different watching players as sort of size in person at the rank, especially when, when you're actually close. And McWard looked like a I don't want to say a big dude, but above average, legit NHL size. He'd change his chair height. Yes. <laughs> uh, whereas Hirose, he legitimately looks lean, skinny, a little undersized. To me, there's a significant size disparity uh, when you see them in person on the ice. Yeah, he plays big. He plays big. Uh, Thatcher Demko starts tonight. Any other things you wanted to get to about tonight's game before we move on here? Because I'm excited for this next segment. I'm very excited. Let's move to the next one. Then. I'm very excited for this next segment. Uh, oh, before we do that, uh, we got to get to our Light the Lamp contest, courtesy of our friends at Four Winds Brewing. Grady, I'll give you a sec there. Yeah, the great. look how fast. Grady's got those lightning fingers, fastest fingers in the West. Okay. Uh, Vancouver is playing Anaheim tonight, and we want to know who's going to score the first goal. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media. Keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal for Vancouver tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army or at Canucks Convo on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure that you ask about the Four Winds Light light lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Andre Kuzmenko, it's my pick. Bold. I, I like it. Uh, JT Miller. JT Miller. Good pick. Good pick. Okay. <clears throat> Let's... Uh, Actually, Grady got this for me. I asked him to pull it up. Uh, can we get the, um, the defense pairings here, Grady? Uh, this is what we saw at practice yesterday because they had an optional morning skate this morning so we didn't see but i wonder because look hughes heronic had a maintenance day i wonder who comes out here like friedman comes out i just i wonder what the lineup really looks like because you're obviously gonna have hughes heronic on the first pair but from there like who's cole mcward's partner is it ian cole thing is th- this um coaching staff has taken you know their you know they call it by committee approach it's been sorry i just heard really <laughs> that was loud so loud. <laughs> that distracted me uh 
they've cycled through and it's hard to sort of definitively say, oh, this is going to be this guy's partner because ultimately, regardless of who McWard takes line rushes with, I expect McWard yep. to not play a lot of minutes. I expect him to be, let's say, around the 14-ish minute mark. Wonder if he gets some shifts with Quinn Hughes, who he had shifts in preseason with. Yeah, that's that's possible. That's a, that's something that could happen. <laughs> but you also don't want to, like, you want to maximize Hughes and Hronik's ice yep. time together. They've been really effective this season. Ultimately, all I know is, regardless of the combos you you see de- deploy, yep. you're going to have Hughes playing a lot. You're going to have Hronik playing a lot. Playing a lot, and then the next tier is going to be Cole and Myers playing a lot, and then the other two, assuming it's McWard and Juleson, they're not going to play as much. Yep, fair enough. It's okay, a, it's the same thing as when Tampa for many years they would have, let's say Jan Ruda or Zach Bogosian playing on the quote unquote top pair yep. with Victor Hedman, because they sort of had an imbalance where they had three amazing lefties in Hedman. McDonough when he was still in Tampa uh, and Sergeyev, but then on the right side, they only had Chernak as a solid righty. And then they would have like Ruda and Bogosian. And so even though you would look at that sort of balance and go, well, one of these righties is going to have to play way like top four minutes, way more than you'd expect by the end of the night, even though Sergeyev would quote unquote be taking line rushes on the third pair, he'd be playing more than 20 minutes a night and it'd be Hedman, McDonough, Sergeyev, even though all of them are lefties doing the heavy lifting, uh, which is why I don't put too much stock into or, or sort of strategic thought into, oh, what are the best combinations? So long as you know, okay, Hughes and Hronik is our rock. The rest of the bottom four, we're going to, we're, we're going to settle it out however we want to, but ultimately deployment and ice time wise it's going to be those four names I mentioned earlier that's going to do the heavy lifting for the blue line. This is an exciting segment. We're going to continue the conversation about the blue line. Go a little more big picture here. This is for our podcast listeners who are maybe listening to this a day after the Canucks have beat the Anaheim Ducks. Eight simple rules for managing the Vancouver Canucks blue line. We've come up with eight things that we think are vital to keeping this blue line fresh, to keeping them competent, and ultimately to keeping the puck out of the Canucks net. I'll go first. My first one feels easy. Keep Hughes Heronic as fresh as possible. They had the morning skate, or they had the maintenance day yesterday off of Canucks practice, and then they were out together at the optional morning skate today. That is exactly what you need to be doing when these guys are playing big minutes and they're playing a ton. The other thing that goes into this same topic is watch their minutes during games. Uh, I've asked Rick talking about this and he's pointed out that power play minutes are easier. Make sure those guys aren't killing too many penalties. Um, Be sure that on a night when you don't need them to play 30 minutes, they are not playing close to 30 minutes. Like keep their ice time down when the opportunity presents itself. And we've seen a couple instances like that this season, but for the most part, obviously those guys have played a ton. Keep that pairing fresh as possible is my first rule. You also don't want to be chasing the game. That's a huge part of it because you look at the San Jose game, for example, Canucks should have come out and in that first period, at least taken the lead, right? And Mm -hmm. put themselves in a situation where, where it feels like they have control of the game and you don't have to use them an extraordinary amount. But instead, the Canucks had a stinker of a first period. They surrender the first goal. All of a sudden, now you're you're trailing, and as a result, Hughes and Hronik's minutes were like they were pu- like Hughes. I think was pushing thirty almost against the San Jose Sharks. That's not ideal. You actually played them more against the Sharks than you than you would against a typical opponent. So those are the, those are the types of things that, as a team, now you're not obviously approaching approaching it and talk it's in the locker room saying, okay, guys, we need to take care of Hughes and Hronik's minutes. We need it. <laughs> we need a big start. Of course, it's not going to go like that, but there are things that when the team as a whole is clicking will allow that pair to be more fresh. Whereas if the team consistently puts itself at a deficit, is consistently chasing the game, then honestly, talk, it's going to have no choice but to have to roll those guys out because who else has offensive uh, touch on this blue line? Fair enough. My second rule, keep the competition Healthy. This is something we've discussed a lot with the forward group in terms of the odd men out, being able to cycle in and out who that is and keeping it kind of a 
you know, keeping everybody accountable. We just talked about how this team seems a lot more accountable than they have in recent years. I think this goes into it. And <clears throat> when you and I were talking before this show, you took it a step further and you said that even goes down to the guys in Abbotsford, not just whoever's sitting in the press box on any given night. Like what I'm saying is, okay, Mark Friedman's in the press box tonight. Let's say Noah Juleson has a bad game. Mark Friedman comes in next game and he knows that, okay, if I don't play well, then I've got a guy right behind me who's going to be itching to get back in the lineup. But you brought up Abbotsford and I found that interesting. Yeah, well, it just felt last season like when OEL, for example, went down with injury the second half of the season down the stretch, a, a bunch of the Abbotsford players like Will Annan, like Juleson were recalled and it didn't feel like the blue line had uh, skipped a beat. I mean, even Breezebaugh, who we still saw him at the rank the other day before practice. So that's good. At least seeing him around the facility, but he hasn't skated in forever. I'd be great to have him healthy again because he's another at least safer, reliable, calmer option. But last season, it just felt like the Abbotsford defensemen, you weren't as worried about those guys drawing into the lineup. And when those guys are playing competent minutes, it increases the competition at competition level, as you said, and it forces other players to level up. I also, I also think it goes back to what they talked about in training camp, and that was that, first of all, <clears throat> Jeremy Colleton was on the ice a lot, but Tockett spoke about how him and Colleton are keeping in pretty close touch about making sure the things that are taught down in Abbotsford are also being what's up in Vancouver. Like, those teams are playing the same systems, for example, that type of thing. Um I think that's something that goes further into that of making sure that whoever the next man up is from Abbotsford can kind of step in and not be like, okay, I got to learn this. I got to learn this. I got to learn this. It's like, no, this is basically what I've been doing in Abbotsford just much, much faster because obviously it's the NHL. Okay. Your first rule. Number three, for me, this is a smaller thing, but it can compound and make a difference over the long haul is I'd like to see the Canucks is, blue liners especially aside from Hughes and Honig because they don't need this work dedicating extra practice time to work on their puck skills now this may seem sort of strange or cliche but I remember talking to Luke Shen last season I believe and I was speaking to him about how he essentially rebuilt his career because this is a player who in Anaheim was waived passed up on waivers nobody wanted him was an unspectacular sort of depth player at that point. And of course, got to the point where he was effectively caddying uh, Hughes in a top four role. Did the same thing in Toronto with Morgan Riley. Got a big contract in Nashville, especially at an older age. So it's like, this is an unprecedented sort of aging curve, if you will. Hmm. And one of the things that he highlighted that I found so interesting was this idea that he said NHL practices aren't really designed to help defensemen work on their puck skills. Because what he referenced is that a lot of the drills as a defenseman, let's say you're defending the rush or it's a lot of battle drills, you aren't making a lot of, let's say, breakouts under pressure. You aren't working on a lot of puck retrievals in your own end, spinning off of checks, uh, some of your edge work, just the little five to 10 foot plays that add up and make a huge difference in terms of how quickly you can uh, get, out of, get out of your own zone. And so when Shen got sent down uh, to San Diego, he immediately called up Adam Oates and spent a ton of time working on those skills rather than just focusing on performance at the gym and getting bigger and getting faster. And we saw it made a world of a difference for him. It's not that all of a sudden he became a great puck mover, but he at least had a decent first pass. And the reason I especially wanted to bring this up was because uh, at practice yesterday, after the main session, I really liked that Adam Foote had a drill that he ran for about 10 minutes uh, where he had all of the defensemen. And of course, Hughes and Hronik, uh had a maintenance day. And it's it's funny, I was joking that even if they were there, they probably wouldn't need to participate. Hmm. But it's a simple one-touch passing drill. They just had all the defensemen sort of in, um, in a semicircle and just working on quick one-touch passes. And those, those little things matter because, you again, you don't get those reps in regular practices. And it's not, not like the offseason where you're, where you're um, you know, getting a lot of extra, you know, additional ice time. So whether it's morning skate, whether it's, um, you know, optional practices after your main practices, 
I think it would make a big difference if Juleson, Friedman, those types of defensemen are working as hard as they can on their puck skills. I like that. And again, that's the part of the game that those guys struggle with. And that's really good insight from Luke Shen and obviously from you that NHL practices aren't really designed to help those guys excel at those things. And hey, you just pointed out Adam Foote uh, putting in the work with them there. Okay, I'm going to keep this one short. Keep shifts short. Very cliche. You're tired, blah, blah, blah. We hear all this. Keep your shifts short. Don't stay out there for too long. No matter who you are, forward, defenseman, it's only going to help the Canucks overall defending. Not so much just their blue line. going to help their team defense if everybody keeps their shifts short. Okay, what do you got here? The forwards need to be as disciplined as possible when it comes to penalties. For instance, what we saw in the Seattle game, and of course the PK bailed them out in that game, but you can't take offenses on penalties. It, it seems like there's been moments throughout the season where they've taken where they've taken unnecessary penalties. Now, look, some penalties are more useful than others. If you're tracking a guy on the back check, odd man rush, and you have to tie a guy up, so you're trying to prevent a backdoor um, backdoor pa- backdoor tap in, that's a good penalty to take. But some of these holding penalties or obstruction when you're on the four check, that's just a little bit lazy, especially because I wanted to highlight this. The blue line as a whole already takes a lot of penalties. I'm not going to expect them. Like, sure, I can say, oh, the defensemen should take less penalties, but that's just not realistic. The blue line personnel are who they are. It's on the forwards to help them out as much as possible. So, for instance, if you look at the last four seasons, including this one, 215 NHL defensemen that have logged at least 1,500 five and five minutes Myers has taken the second most penalties of all NHL defensemen. Ian Cole has taken the third most penalties of all NHL defensemen. Carson Soucy has taken the 23rd most penalties of all NHL defensemen. Philip Peronik is pretty high up there as well. Cole McWard drawing into the lineup. We saw that he took a lot of penalties in preseason as well. The point I'm trying to make is I'm not going to all of a sudden expect, like these are multi-year habits. I'm not expecting those players, especially a guy like Cole who does lack foot speed to all of a sudden, uh, you know, cut down on those. To me, it's okay. As a forward group, you guys need to be as disciplined as possible, especially because I'm looking at the Canucks' penalty kill numbers and they've definitely been improved on the season. It's definitely not the tire fire that it was last year, but you look at some of the underlying results. Canucks rank 29th on the penalty kill in terms of their shot against rate and 27th in expected goals against. So, this is not a PK unit that can bail you out consistently, in my opinion. Plus, the more time you spend shorthanded, those are just heavy taxing minutes, especially for those defensemen that are going to have to be blocking shots, battling down low. And we talk about wanting to keep Hughes and Hronik as fresh and as fresh as possible, especially Hronik, who logs a ton of shorthanded minutes. The onus, in my opinion, has to be on the forwards to stay out of the box. You deleted one of mine by accident in the Oh, dock. did I? Yeah, you did. And I can't figure out what it was. It was something good, I thought. But you just I took don't it think, out of the- No, I, I rearranged my one and moved it up. Oh, I see. I it didn't now. delete any of yours. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You're going to blame me? Well, I'm like looking at the dock. Anyways, anyways. Um, okay, this is a good one. I think you actually wrote this one. But simplify Tyler Myers' game and stay healthy enough to limit him to 18 minutes per night. You're not going to get comments from Rick Tockett that Tyler Myers has been one of our best players if Tyler Myers is playing in that 2-3 role that he's been forced to play throughout his Canucks tenure. The thing he was struggling with so much earlier in the season was not making the simple plays. This has been highlighted a lot in the Stanchies a lot recently. Wyatt's done an exceptional job of pointing this out, but there's been a few plays where Myers has looked like a completely different defenseman because he has just held on to the puck and he's just using his huge frame to shield off the opposition and they cannot get to the puck because he is larger than them. It is simple. It, that is what simplifying your game looks like, making the smart plays, not being so frantic and, dare I say, chaotic in your own zone. Myers has really cleaned that up and it's allowed the Canucks to be better in all areas of the ice because he's making these better decisions, these simple decisions, most notably in his own end on the breakout attempts, but... You know, just a a good example is he goes into the corner. There's two four checkers coming down on him. Before, we've seen him shoot it up the middle, 
hammer it up the wall as hard as he can and just try to get it out, do something crazy as fast as possible. But it, lately what we've seen him do, and watch for this tonight, folks, is he'll shield shield the puck and they'll be on either side of him, but he'll wait until maybe the last possible second and then just calmly chip it up to the winger, who obviously with two guys forechecking is somewhat open and he has the ability to then make the next play. And it all starts with Tyler Myers just making a simple, safe, play hanging on to the puck for an extra second longer but keeping it in a safe space this is a great one for managing the Canucks blue line allow Tyler Myers to keep playing that simple game we've seen lately that's led to talk saying he's one of the best players of all time <laughs> part of it is also out of the Canucks's control which is staying healthy enough so that you're able to reduce his minutes so he's only in the 18-ish minute range and not just volume of minutes but the matchups that entails because when Myers is pushing 20 plus that means he's going to spend a big chunk of his minutes against top six competition and that's where I think he can get exposed a little bit whereas if he's in a spot where he's mostly playing middle six bottom six competition that's when I feel like you're putting him more so in a position to succeed because I'll say this for as much as we criticize Myers and the contract, look, we know he's overpaid. I really believe that he'd be totally fine as a bottom pair defenseman on a good team that has the right support around him. I believe that would be the type of environment that would be conducive for him to play a simpler, calmer style. And it was interesting. I think talking in one of his availabilities specifically cited that he was mentioning to Myers that, hey, you don't need to lead the rush earlier in the season that, that that that's one of the things they told him was you don't need to be as aggressive pushing up the ice and trying to make things happen offensively and that's also the mark of a lot of smart veterans one of the things i loved about luke shen for example was that he knew exactly the parameters of what he could and couldn't do that's a great point he never tried to do too much whereas sometimes you have defensemen and because they have physical gifts they will try and do things that put themselves in trouble. And that's where sometimes with Myers even, sometimes they'll be pinching too aggressively in the mm -hmm. wrong spot and it leaves him in a bad position, right? And those are the areas that he's cleaned up recently uh, that, um, that uh, has helped him, I think, play a cleaner overall game. Okay, uh, we have seven on this, Doc. I thought we had eight. Uh, so seven simple rules for managing the Canucks defense. You've got the final one here. Yeah. Uh, again, going back to what to what Talkit said um, yesterday that I thought was really interesting, and it's an extension of the conversation we had last week where we were mentioning that, okay, so much of the Canucks' problem with the blue line has been on breakouts, and part of the onus is on the forwards to hustle harder. And, and Talkit had mentioned that they needed to do some work with the forwards to review tape and and sort of ensure that their wingers and centers are coming deep enough and in, in the right positions and, and becoming open. As an add-on, he mentioned yesterday that they also need to demand the puck, that they need to be vocal about uh, really wanting it, that it's also not just being in the right spot, but making it really easy so that as soon as you get the puck as a defenseman on a puck retrieval, you don't have to think about what you're going to do with, with it. I, I think that's where defensemen who are less skilled, they run into issues when they're hanging on to the puck too long because they're analyzing, analyzing their options and trying to decide what to do. Whereas if you're a forward and you're beaver, beaver tailing it, it's so easy where as a defenseman, before you even get the puck, you already know what you're going to do with it. And that mm -hmm. makes a world of a difference. You don't have to think. And that's why some defensemen, you want to know why Florida, for example, can turn almost every defenseman into a good player. We, we, we've we seen them reclamation projects with Forsling and Montour and Ekman Larson. It's because, and I, and I specifically saw this with, with OEL as well, and we know that his foot speed is not the best. Their wingers will come back and they're demanding the puck. And so OEL, when he's coming around, it's just a, it's just a one touch he doesn't even need to fully corral the puck. One touch backhand, rim to the wall, and it's it's a clean breakout. So that's you know one area where it's not just being in the right spot too. It's it's really demanding it because I'll say this uh, too. I'm sure everybody who's you know whether it's 
hockey or, or, or soccer, sometimes you'll know of, of teammates where they're in the right spot, but they don't really want to get puck possession there. Mm-hmm. And so they're in the right spot, but you can tell they're sort of like looking to hide a little bit uh, or they aren't quite coming deep enough. And that's where a defenseman takes that extra half a second to be like, okay, is this when you're actually in a spot where he wants the puck, is he safe? Uh, and so that, that means taking more responsibility on for the forwards. Okay, so that was seven rules. Uh, Grady, do you have an eighth rule? You can just say no if you don't. But uh, I'd like us to come up with... We can come up with an eighth rule. What's the eighth rule to managing the Canucks defense? Come on. Clone Quinn Hughes. Boom. Done. Clone Quinn Hughes. And there you have it, folks. Uh, Okay. It's time now for anyone else presented by DoorDash. Lots in the chat today. It's our listener's chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more. For a limited time, our listeners get 25% off zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters, NATION25. The numbers, 25. Offer valid in Canada, subject change, terms do apply. Okay, we've got a lot in here. I'm going to start one here from Grim Studio who asked, are you act or anyone is anyone else actually concerned about Heronic's brutal defensive play? That end to end play in the Sharks game was an absolute failure, not just from him, like we pointed out yesterday, but more so becoming a trend. Also in the Avs game, Harmon, are you worried about Philip Heronic's defensive play? I'm not worried about it. I just think he's an average defensive player. I think he has the potential to be slightly above average when he's at his best, like he was earlier in the season. But there's a reason why Detroit didn't use him against top competition. And that earlier in his career, when Heronic was going up against top lines, he struggled in that role, uh, which is that he's not, he's not a do it all number one defenseman, which is fine. But when he's, when you're logging that many minutes, it, it's tough for me to look at Heronic and, and expect more. This is sort of the, this is the player he's always been, uh, which is to say, it's funny. I actually think he's improved a lot from where Heronic was earlier in his career. There's no doubt about it. Oh, Heronic, for sure. Yep. Earlier in his career was an offensive guy that you could not trust at all defensively. And it's last season that he really took the step in becoming a more reliable to a defenseman who can apply pressure. This is part of the scouting report. Uh, and to me, I'd say the only area it'd be a concern for me is more so big picture in the sense of, okay, when you look at a statistical case, when you look at the type of contract he's going to demand, he's, he's in for a massive payday. That's where it would concern me where, okay, if this is a player who's going to be making, let's say just to throw a number out there, I'm not saying this is what he's actually going to get on his next contract, but if he's in the seven and a half million dollar range as a defenseman and you're paying him high end top pair defense money, that's when it's like, okay, that's my point. That's not, that's not a, that you're not loving that contract when a player is only average defensively. Cause you also have to consider what the player would look like without Quinn Hughes. Yeah. Right. And that's a big thing that I think the Canucks are probably going to bring up when negotiations start for his next contract. Okay. Uh, this is quickly becoming a segment. So we thank you mother knucker for getting this one in. Um, <clears throat> this is our Canucks convo viewer slash listener heater. Of the day, heater trade proposal of the day. So I'm gonna flip it to you, Harmon. I love, I love this that people bring in the heater trade proposal. I read it out loud, and you have to answer it. Okay. With the crazy situation in Chicago, would it not make sense for us, the Canucks, to send someone like Beauvillier or Garland as a cap floor player for someone like Murphy, who is a solid top four right-handed defenseman in the ilk of Ian Cole? Be nice, Harmon. That's okay. What he wrote. Okay. I th- I thought- he wrote, "Be nice, Harmon." When when somebody when you're starting with Chicago and referencing all that's gone wrong, I thought you were gonna go with some crazy Bedard trade proposal. I've hello. seen those. Well, okay, what would I'm it glad take? this is, actually, it this is how, not, how could the Canucks get Bedard? I'm just not, I'm just this is actually not a bad um, No, it's actually not idea. It's not. I just like calling it a heater trade proposal. Let me see here. Yeah, take your time. Uh, I'm, I'm looking it over again just to fully process it. Yeah, take your time because I should actually um update uh, obviously the viewers. Listeners are probably going to know by now. Uh, Kyle Davidson held a press conference today 
uh, spoke about the Corey Perry situation and he talked about how uh, he couldn't really dive into it much more. But look, all these rumors, Daily Faceoffs, Frank Saravalli, who's going to be on the show tomorrow, um, dispelled all the rumors about Perry and a, a teammate's mother, which was crazy. We talked about that yesterday. Just, yeah, not true, obviously. Uh, Kyle Davidson did say that he can't reveal any de- details because it is a workplace matter. This does not involve any player or their families, and anyone that suggests otherwise is wildly inaccurate, and it's frankly disgusting. And I absolutely believe uh, Kyle Davidson here that that's true. I, I, Yeah, I, I believe him here. Okay. And I agree with him that I th- those comments and like I saw a tweet from our pal JD Burke this morning too that I really liked and he you know he pointed out he's like look there's there's bits look we know bits on this show but that bit that's going around right now it's not really that funny especially if you've left high school that's what JD wrote and I thought that was very true uh and I'd like to leave it at that yeah okay let's get to the trade proposal yes so I don't think that this makes quite as much sense as I sort of initially thought because Murphy makes 4.4. So it's not really helping the caps or the, the Hawks, Hawks get to the floor. I mean, I guess it would make sense from a perspective of Bedard has no forwards to play with, but even from the Canucks perspective, Murphy making 4.4 until 2026. I don't know if I love that contract to be totally honest. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if Murphy moves the needle enough. I'd have to watch a lot of tape and really do a deep dive on his game because Look, if Murphy was making, let's say, $3 million, I'd be all over that. But also then a lot of teams would be all over mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. I don't love the contract. It's, With the cap going up too, you still don't love it? I don't. I mean, here's the, the thing that um, is interesting to me because this is another Chicago defenseman. But, for instance, um, Toronto acquired Jake McCabe as part of the Lafferty deal and, and gave up a first gave up a first for it. So first of all, I, like you're not just going to get it for a pure gap cap dump. You're going to have to add actual value, which means that you're going to have to give up a significant sort of asset. Again, in in Toronto's case, they gave up a first round pick for for Jake McCabe. Now, of course, that came with retention, uh, which which made the contract a lot more palatable. But that has not suited. Like that's not been a good trade for. Toronto McCabe has not fit well. And McCabe fits, I think, a similar profile as Murphy, where I'm like, yeah, he's a top four defenseman on a bad team, but is he a top four defenseman on a good team? Does he really move the needle? Do I like the contract? Uh, and so seeing how it's gone for tor- for Toronto, and again, how much of a price you'd have to pay, either for a retention to make the contract more palatable, or if you're not asking for a retention, of course, the trade cost, the acquisition cost is lower but then you're worried about the contract. I don't know if I love this. I don't know if I love Murphy as uh, as a trade target. Again, I, you, you'd have to do a lot of work on, on the video, on the pro scouting, pro scouting set to be confident that um, he's worth the contract. Or if you are asking the Hawks to retain, then they're going to be asking for a first round pick. I think that's more thought than the Canucks pro scouting department ever did under Jim Benning. <laughs> like, in terms of looking into a player, you just brought up all that stuff you need to look into. Wish the Canucks had done that during the Benning years. I'm sure they did. Yeah. I just don't think they were very good at evaluating defensemen. We're sure. We're sure they did. That's like I'd you like say, there's were, so sure. many good options when we look at the Canucks historical defensemen. Okay. Uh, we'll close out anyone else on this one from Trip. We'll both answer it. Uh, Grady, you can jump in and answer it too if you want. But this one from our, our listener, Trip. If you were going to create a package for a legitimate top 4D, who would you be more willing to give up? Pod Colson, Huglander, or LeCaramacchi? I think it's a bit of a loaded question because presumably all those guys have different uh, different values. Who of those three right now, Harmon, do you think has the highest value on the trade market? Okay, Pod Colson doesn't. He's Obviously. Third. It's either Huglander or LeCaramacchi. It would depend on what a team's priorities are, and I think it would be different. I think it would be different for every team. The reason I say that is because a team like Calgary, for instance, that would want that's looking for NHL talent. They're they're in more of a retool retool um, mode. They can probably look at Hoaglander and go, "This is a guy that can step into our lineup right now. Mm-hmm. Is already proving to offer NHL value. Plug and play, easy. He has higher trade value for us." But a rebuilding team 
may look at, let's say, like Karamaki tearing it up in the SHL, and, and maybe they view him as a prospect that has a, has a higher ceiling. Which he does, uh, let's or, be honest. Like or, Karamaki has a higher ceiling than yeah. does Huglander, but right now, who knows? Like Maybe Huglander has a higher floor. That's the other thing. And that's kind of what yeah. you're talking about when it comes to a team-by-team -team basis. Also, some teams may may differ on their perception of Hoaglander's start. Yep. Like, what if they look at Hoaglander's hot start and just think it's a shooting percentage eater? Mm -hmm. Which I don't think this is, that's the case, but other teams may not may not like that. But also on, on the Karamaki side, some teams may not like a prospect that is um, more perimeter-oriented, that is undersized, more of a power play, projects as a power play mm -hmm. type piece. Uh, this is one of those hypotheticals that it really comes down to as an organization, what timeline do you want for, for this younger player to hit? And I, I honestly really believe that Hoaglander and Lakaramaki would be pretty polarizing in terms of some teams may really covet them and some teams may not have much time at all for them, uh, especially because some teams may look at Hoaglander's defensive play and go, we, this is too much of a project. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we, we don't think he has a hockey sense to figure this out. Um, they're both polarizing young players and I think their values would sort of differ based on Team to team, and I also say this: they would, whether it's Hoaglander or Lakaramaki, I don't think either would be the centerpiece for for uh, um, a legit top four defenseman. I don't quite think. Put it this way: if I was an NHL GM and I had a, top, a really good top four defenseman, let's say a Hiro like a Hironic type, sure. I, I would not want Hoaglander or Lakaramaki as the centerpiece. I'd want a first round pick. Fair enough. Fair enough. And maybe, hey, if it's if it's legit top four or top pair that we're talking about, maybe you do have to add a first round pick and one of these pieces uh, that we are discussing here. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Most willing to give up? I, I think at this time you would have to obviously sit by Colson out of those three. But, yeah. you know, maybe Hoaglander's the answer because you have to think that Pod Colson might have a higher floor than what maybe we're seeing right now. Like, like here's here's a quick question for you, and I'll try not to ramble on too long. Who has a higher floor out of Hoaglander or Pod Colson? Well, it's Hoaglander right now because he's already right playing now. In the I'm NHL. saying I'm saying potential though. Down the line, I I think Pod Colson has the higher chance of being a legit bottom four or yeah bottom six player. I don't think Hoaglander long-term is going to be a bottom six player in the NHL. I think he needs to be a middle six winger. Pod Colson could become a fourth liner. Uh, I, I don't think that has to be the case. I get what you're saying in that Pod Colson is, has a size to be more of the prototypical bottom six piece, but NHL bottom sixes are ev evolving. They don't need to all be checkers and, and penalty killers, and Hoaglander's already proving it. I think right now, Hoaglander, especially because even his rookie season, he put, you know, the level that he was producing at five on five, to do that, 20 years old is incredibly promising in terms of profiling future NHLer. Right, like clear cut, not just right now. Hoaglander has the higher NHL floor right now. Fair enough. Uh, Grady, you want to jump yeah, in here? I'm just going to say, I think on that <clears throat> trio of players that was listed, Lakara Mackey is going to be last simply because uh, he was actually drafted by this administration. Pod Coles and Hoaglander was from the Benning regime. And I think LeCarrie Mackey probably has the highest upside out of any of them, as you guys alluded to there. But yeah, you've seen in the past with other GMs when they come into a team, they're kind of more willing to, you know, throw guys over that they didn't inherit or mm -hmm. that they didn't draft as theirs. That's a great point, Grady. And we talk about ceilings. LeCarrie Mackey does have the highest ceiling of any of those. LeCarrie Mackey's ceiling is like a first line contributor and plays on your first power play unit. That's his ceiling. Don't know if he's going to hit it. But that's his ceiling, and I don't think that's Pod Colson or Huglander's yeah. ceiling. I mean, Lakaramaki, if he hits, could be... I don't know if, if his ceiling is quite a Kuzmenko type, but that's the type of role where, okay, you're, you're, you're important on the power play. I'm not looking at you at 5-on-5 five five as a play driver, but as an offensive finisher and as somebody who the coach might have some troubles with in terms of the defensive side. Yeah. I, I see him as a potential successor for... Kuzmenko, which matters because Kuzmenko's deal is up in two years. And if Lakaramaki can come in at some point and replicate what Kuzmenko does uh, for a significantly cheaper price on an ELC, well, then all those dollars are freed up and you can use it to bolster third line center or your, your blue line down the road. Uh, people are talking about Lego rocks in our YouTube live chat. Shout out Gio. He's done some work with us in the past. Uh, BCIT student, Gio. He's a good dude. 
Um, Lego Rocks 99. Just want to give him a shout out. But be sure to subscribe to our channel, folks. Uh, the subscribe to the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Hit that bell so that you don't miss our shows and our show clips, which are uploaded daily. Okay, that was a really solid anyone else segment. I think we had a really solid show today. We said we'd try to keep it short. Turned out to be longer as it so often does. Sorry to uh, that Sean guy, or what, what? I can't remember his name. Shane, maybe, uh, that wanted us to do a 10-minute show. Not happening. Uh, okay, let's get to our Betway bet of the day, Grady. And uh, I was torn on this one because part of me wanted to say Kuzmenko is the first goal scorer of the game because I picked him as my four wins uh, guy to light the lamp. Anytime goal scorer. I don't know if it's going to be the first goal but Kuzmenko is the anytime goal scorer plus 200 odds on that over at Betway. A $10 bet returns you $20. Um, I think I forgot to put it in. Anyways, $10 bet returns you $20. Must be 19 plus play. If you choose to play, please play responsibly over at Betway. 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 It would return you 20 profit, giving you 30 total. Thank you, Grady. I don't know why that wasn't all. I thought I'm I'd never do that. I was going to say it was plus 200. But I did the, I, I know I did the screen. Great. Did I mess that up or was that you? That was all you, bud. What? <laughs> all right. What do you Grady guys? might be gaslighting me. I don't know. <laughs> no, I just pulled whatever is whatever is really? in the work table. I always, okay. Anyways, there was anyways. a, uh, I like this comment from, let me just see if I can find it here. Uh, they, uh, apologies for, oh, Pim Pam Strong. Brock Besser is scoring first on Hockey Fights Cancer Night. Yes, okay. that, great, great poll, Grady. I wanted to get to that, actually. That's a great, great guess. Uh, we'll see. Come on, give me, a, give me a goal score tonight. Just anyone? Anyone. I like the Brock pick. Okay. Uh, that's Harvard's like going that. with the vibes. I like it. Good vibes on uh, Hockey Nights. Hockey Fights Cancer Night uh, over at Rogers Arena tonight when the Canucks take on the Anaheim Ducks. We'll be back tomorrow to break it down, folks. But for now... Signing off. My name is Dave Gudrelli. That is Harmon Dial. Our technical producer, of course, is Grady Sass. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads every weekday at 2 p.m. Be sure to check it out on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. And if you missed it, go check it out on your favorite podcast catcher app.